Hello, my name is Carolyn Gannett, and I'm the manager of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Welcome to the Multi-Species Management and Conservation Awareness um, virtual workshop. This is a joint workshop hosted by Nature Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Prairie uh, Plan. Uh, when we've had these workshops, the small town okay. I hope everyone can hear me. I had an audio issue disconnected. Um, anyways, we're so happy that you could join us tonight. Um, I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and uh, communities, past and present. Oh, sorry. So for Amalia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life that these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Uh, this evening, we have a nice lineup of speakers. Um, we'll start with uh, Ashley Vass from Nature Saskatchewan providing an update on their programs. And then we'll have Francois Blouin and Heather Pete Ham discuss the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association's Habitat and Biodiversity Ass Assessment Tool. And then we'll close out the evening with myself and Sue Mahalski, who will go over PCAP's Multi Species at Risk Habitat Attributes Guide. Um, so, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. A reminder to all our listeners out there, you are all currently muted and we can't see you in case that was a concern. There is uh, the option to only view the presentation and not the webcam if bandwidth is an issue where you are. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you are on a cell phone, you can send your question by chat to the organizer. Um, questions will be answered at the end of each presentation as time permits, so we may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we'll try our best. This workshop is being recorded and will be uploaded to PCAPS and NatureSask's YouTube channels in the near future. Um, I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's workshop is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Mosaic Company, the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, TC Energy, the ELSA Fund, the Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, and the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act. Now I will pass it over to uh, Ashley from Nature Saskatchewan. Um, Ashley has been uh, with Nature Saskatchewan since 2014 and is the Rare Plant Rescue Habitat Stewardship Coordinator. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Just going to share my webcam here. Great. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, again, thanks Carolyn for the introduction and um, Nature Sask is really happy to be partnering with PCAP for this event. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're happy to have you here. Um, so first of all, I get to start with the fun part. Did somebody say prizes? Um, so we're gonna actually have three door prizes to give away tonight. A copy of our Birds of Saskatchewan book, uh, as well as two shirts. It'll be your choice of either a long sleeve uh, shirt featuring a monarch butterfly sketch or one of our Operation Brewing Owl 30th anniversary shirts that features a brewing owl sketch. Uh, so the choice would be yours, but be aware that sizes are limited. 
Uh, with each of the three prizes, we're also going to include a 2021 Species at Risk calendar and a free Nature Saskatchewan membership. Um, so if you're unable to stay for the whole presentation, don't worry because uh, we're still going to enter you into the door prize draw and the winners are going to be notified uh, via email afterwards. Oh, I also just want to plug that all of this merchandise and more is available at our store online. So uh, all the uh, fundraising from the merchandise goes towards programming. Um, so please take a look at our store at naturesask.ca slash store. Okay, um, so I'm going to kick off the talks tonight and just give a brief uh, presentation. I'll briefly talk about Nature Sask as an organization and then I'll uh, get into our Stewards of Saskatchewan programs. Um, but before I do that, I want to do a poll. So Carolyn, if you could load up the first poll, just to get to know each other a little bit. There we go. Okay, so um, so if if you're able and willing, if you could please select uh, which best describes you. So we've got a few categories there. I'll give you a minute to load up some responses here. If you're anything like me, you might fit into a few of these categories, but that's okay. We're not going to require proof. <laughs> So I don't know if you can tell Carolyn if uh, you're getting some responses. Yeah, about 97% have voted so far. Oh, okay, that's great. So I'll close it and show it. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Let's see if I can see the answers. Could you read me the percentages there? Sure. Uh, landowner, producer, agriculture is at 28%. Um, researcher, academic, student is 8%. Okay. Um, naturalist, environmental supporter is 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, working in the environmental field is 25%, and other is 14%. That's awesome. We have a really good mix, and it's interesting to see that it's quite a bit different from our last uh, event that we had, so um, that's wonderful. Uh, it's great to be able to speak to a diverse crowd. Thank you for doing the poll. Um, okay, so just a brief overview of Nature Saskatchewan. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, Nature Saskatchewan was founded in 1949. Uh, we're a non-government charitable organization. Um, we're a member-based organization, so we currently have about 600 members. Uh, we're locally affiliated with 16 nature societies, and our national affiliate is Nature Canada. Uh, and we are Saskatchewan's largest volunteer-driven nonprofit naturalist organization. And we pride ourselves on being a voice for nature in Saskatchewan. Uh, so Nature Saskatchewan's vision is humanity in harmony with nature. And our mission is to engage and inspire people to appreciate, learn about, and conserve Saskatchewan's natural environment. Um, well, Nature Saskatchewan has many different types of programming. I'm just going to specifically focus on the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs for tonight. Um, so these programs are aimed at conserving prairie habitat for all prairie species, uh, but they focus on their respective target species. So they all have slight differences from one another. Uh, however, they were all modeled after the oldest and largest SOS program, which is Operation Burrowing Owl. Um, it was initiated in 1987 and it's actually one of the longest running stewardship programs, uh, voluntary stewardship programs in Canada. Uh, and this program targets, of course, the endangered burrowing owl. Uh, rare Plant Rescue focuses on 16 federally listed and provincially rare plant species. Shrubs for Shrikes targets the threatened loggerhead shrike. Plovers on Shore focuses on the endangered piping plover. Um, and then our most recent program that was initiated in 2010 is the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program. Uh, this one was created to offer opportunities to uh, landowners that wanted to engage um, in our programs and conserve habitat for species at risk that weren't already targeted by the um, original four. Okay. Um, so by using ambassador species, such as the iconic burrowing owl, uh, to promote habitat conservation within a specific program. Um, all of the programs 
are allowed to sort of work towards the goal of overall prairie conservation and maintaining biodiversity throughout Saskatchewan. Okay, so now that we've done a quick review of the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs, uh, let's do another poll. So Carolyn, if you don't mind launching that this poll. Here we go. So I'd like to know if you have heard of the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs before tonight. And your options are yes, I'm a participant, yes, I've heard of them, or no. And I'll just give a minute for people to respond to that one. It's less reading than the last question. So how are we doing on this one, Carolyn? Good, we're at 95%. Okay, I'll close it. Somebody grabbed a drink of water or something. <laughs> I should be able to read the responses on this one. Oh, it's still a little too small for me. Would you mind reading the um, percentages? Sure. Uh, Five percent said that yes, I'm a participant of one or more programs. Seventy-three percent said yes, that they had heard of the programs before, and 22% said no. Okay, that's excellent. Um, so yeah, it's really great. I'm glad to know that the word is getting out there and people have heard of the programs. Um, I'm also happy to be able to bring some new information to people that haven't heard of us before. Um, and of course, it's fantastic to hear that some of our participants are on tonight. So thanks so much. It's nice to uh, be able to speak at you. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into um, the meat and potatoes of our programming. So all four uh, of the Nature Saskatchewan stewardship programs have um, the same goals, or sorry, the five programs have four main goals. Uh, the first is habitat stewardship. Second is site identification and population monitoring. The third goal is habitat enhancement. And the fourth is education and awareness. So with habitat stewardship, um, our objective is to conserve habitat for the target species and for other wildlife um, through voluntary stewardship agreements and informed stewardship action. Uh, participants sign a voluntary handshake agreement. So they agree to conserve the nesting areas and the habitat for the species. Um, they agree to not unduly disturb the species. And they also agree to annually report species observations on their land. Um, this agreement is non-binding and it can actually be cancelled at any time. So these um, commitments are really attractive to landowners because they're not too invasive or um, binding. However, um, you know, generally people don't cancel the agreements. So they're, they're able to at any time, but um, people stick with the programs because they really enjoy them once they get involved. Currently, there's uh, 935 program participants, and they're conserving over 475,000 acres and 137 miles of shoreline habitat. And this is for the target species at risk, but also other wildlife. Um, so also, when we say informed stewardship, um, we basically mean confirming what practices uh, that landowners and participants are already doing that are supporting the species and the habitat. And then we share small changes that they might want to consider um, to further enhance or support the habitat through site-specific management uh, practices plans. And then we also ensure that we can keep to up to date on which options exist to support landowners um, that are stewarding the land. So for example, conservation easements uh, is one example, and we can connect uh, landowners that are interested in that um, with a host organization, and they can discuss those options further. Uh, we provide information and support to landowners by visiting as many as possible every year. Uh, landowner visits are a vital component of uh, the programs and they serve many purposes. So face-to-face -face landowner visits are a really great way of just creating that initial uh, relationship, um, but also maintaining the relationship for years to come. Um, so site identification and population monitoring. Um, one of the most important activities is the annual population monitoring. Our objective is to monitor target populations and uh, distribution changes through an annual census at participating uh, enrolled lands. 
for the most part, our monitoring is really done by the participants. Uh, so it's through an annual census card that we mail every uh, spring and we send one out for all of the enrolled land locations. Um, the landowners report the species observations on those locations, as well as any habitat changes or land use changes. Um, rare plant rescue, though, is a little bit different. Uh, so we don't expect participants to go out and search for rare plants and, you know, counting every individual stem on their pasture. Uh, we actually do this for them. <laughs> we have a search and monitoring crew that goes out each year to do just that. Um, so they search for new occurrences of uh, plants, plant species at risk, um, and they also monitor uh, historic or known uh, populations. Uh, the SOS staff also conduct grid road surveys um, for species at risk, and then we'll also verify species sightings that are reported to the hoot line. Um, with landowner permission, the species occurrence information is given to the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre and to the applicable recovery team leads at Environment Canada. Um, the Conservation Data Centre houses all the species occurrence information for the province, um, and no personal information is ever shared. Okay, habitat enhancement. Um, so we offer funding to increase and improve habitat for wildlife with the focal species for these projects being burrowing owls, sprigs pipits, ferruginous hawks, and piping plovers. To date, we funded 137 projects. Um, currently, the habitat enhancement projects include native seeding, and this is to convert cropland in large pastures and reduce fragmentation, uh, wildlife friendly fencing, to preserve uh, newly seeded areas, also to improve pasture health. And um, we also have projects to protect ferruginous hawk nesting sites. Uh, and we also do alternative water development. Um, so for example, solar pumps, and this is also to improve pasture health uh, as well as to protect shoreline. Um, depending on the type of project, it's either a 50% or 100% cost share basis up to a certain maximum dollar amount. Um, and participants sign a 12-year contract uh, to ensure the long-term benefits of the habitat enhancement projects. Education and awareness is our third objective. Um, with this objective, uh, we increase awareness and provide information to uh, landowners, but also just members of the general public about species at risk, biodiversity, and the importance of conserving prairie habitat. Uh, we do two mail outs every year to our participants and this is to keep them in the loop and involved and um, also so they know that they're appreciated. So our spring mail out includes a census card uh, as I mentioned for the annual population monitoring and it also includes updates on programs and any plans for the summer that we know of. Uh, the fall mail out includes our annual newsletter and this actually can keep participants informed about um, any new information on species at risk our programs, as well as other research and events going on in the province. Oh, oh our, our fall and mail out also includes our very popular species at risk calendar that's a part of the door prize package tonight. We also hold uh, conservation awareness and appreciation events um, throughout southern and central Saskatchewan. Um, we normally do two to three every year. Um, it's an expression of our thanks and appreciation to our participants. So not only do we provide information, but uh, we also provide a catered supper and um, other presentations and fun activities for kids. Um, unfortunately, we aren't able to hold in-person events, so we aren't able to do these uh, catered suppers at the moment, um, but we're really excited to start them up again when, when we're able to. Um, so the stewards involved in our programs are really the backbone of everything that we do. So they're the reason that we've been able to continue for so many years. Uh, they're the ones that are managing and caring for both the habitat and the species. And it's because of their care that many of the species at risk that we deal with still even have habitat. Uh, so I just want to give a special thank you to all our participants. Um, and of course, especially the ones that, that are watching tonight. Uh, we're thinking about you and we definitely can't wait to get out there and visit again and uh, see how everything's going when we're allowed to. So what do I do if I spot a species at risk? Call the hoot line. So we have a toll-free uh, hoot line. It's 1-800-667-HOOT. 
Um, calling in species at risk observations can help determine uh, the abundance and distribution of species at risk in Saskatchewan. Um, and of course, it can also potentially lead to habitat conservation for the species at risk and the other wildlife that rely on that habitat. Um, it's important to note that caller information is kept confidential and personal information is never shared without permission. And this includes uh, not only the person who's reporting the sighting, but it also includes the landowner um, who owns the property where the occurrence was, uh, or where the species was observed. So that's that. Um, thank you. I want to thank everybody so much for, again, for being here tonight. Um, but of course, I'd like to thank our partners and supporters and all of those you know, who've contributed in various ways and capacities over the years. Um, we wouldn't be able to do any of this work without the support from our funders, partners, and most importantly, as I've mentioned before, the stewards. So thank you so much. Um, so that's it for me, Carolyn, if, uh, if there's any questions. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, there are no questions currently. Okay. Um, Feel free to email me. So, or... if anyone, yeah, if anyone has any questions for about any of the SOS programs, oh, there is one question. Okay. Um, so, if anyone has any questions about the SOS programs, you can type them in the dashboard, and uh, Caitlin Burroughs is uh, navigating her, I guess moderating and watching that question box um, they can she can answer those questions for you once we've moved on to the next presentation um, so the one question that there is is what can rms do to support nature saskatchewan's mission oh rms yeah well there's lots of things they can do so um we can provide you with posters of species that we're looking for um, posters that would include our hoot line so then um, you know people can get our phone number and if they see species at risk they can definitely give us a call um, also if like there's graders and obviously RM um, staff that are going to be out there on the roads and stuff so they can watch out for species too uh, but when it comes to road graders we've had some instances where um, there's been burrowing owl uh, burrows sometimes they burrow straight into the ditch like right at the side of the road so the graders can keep an eye out for those and uh, we've even had occasions where they put up flags and kind of avoided that uh, grading that area so that's been a huge help um, and yeah and we also have a lot of information that we can spread so uh, we have brochures and uh, all sorts of stuff our calendar even you know we can send those out to the RMs and getting the word out there is one of the best ways to support you know the species and habitat conservation it's nice to have neighbors and, and people talking about it together um, you know more of a community feel it really helps out awesome thanks Ashley mm -hmm. um, we'll move on to our next uh, presentation thank you yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, now, a bit about our next presenters. Um, François Bouin is a wildlife biologist with 25 years of experience on species at risk conservation and habitat stewardship in the Prairie Provinces. He has been the lead consultant in the development of the habitat and biodiversity assessment tool for the Alberta environmental farm plan and provides advice and support for the development and implementation implementation of HVAT in other provinces. Heather Pete Ham is an ecologist, illustrator, and a species at risk consultant currently working for the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association to adapt the habitat and biodiversity assessment tool for Saskatchewan producers. Um, okay, so Heather, we're just waiting to see your screen. Okay. Um, have you accepted the... I have. It should be up. Mine's showing up. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, always a few little glitches with 
online, it's so much easier in person, but meanwhile, we'll make, make do with what we have. Um, yeah, so I want to speak to you um, about building a habitat and biodiversity assessment tool for Saskatchewan. Uh, and the background on this is that a habitat and biodiversity assessment tool was built for Alberta's uh, agricultural landscape uh, in, I think, over the last three years, and Francois can correct me on that. Um, and it was built to be part of the environmental farm plan. Um, and last year, uh, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association was given the mandate to expand the tool and adapt the tool for use in other provinces. Um, and the current work is ongoing to adapt the tool for Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia. And clearly I am working on the Saskatchewan tool um, uh, with counterparts in those other two provinces. And Francois is pretty, uh, providing all the technical assistance um, to connect us to the actual tool and process our data and uh, answer every question every day. Uh, <laughs> we keep him busy. So, uh, you may ask, well, why do we want this tool? Um, and one of the reasons we're looking at that increasingly markets in agricultural uh, products are, are concerned about the sustainability of land used to produce the product. Um, and for example, if you look at like one planet business for biodiversity and you look at the businesses that are, are becoming part of that, you look at Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and there are others. Um, so this tool is beginning, uh, hopefully a beginning to assist landowners in working towards uh, continued stewardship that's already ongoing and meeting new market needs. So the goals of the tool from a landowner's perspective is to evaluate what species are potentially on your land, to determine what habitat exists on your land, and this is through a question system that uh, Francois will describe in more detail. And then it will provide suggested stewardship, op stewardship opportunities that contribute to habitat stewardship and often to the resilience of operations as well. So if there's an opportunity for both things, we try to include those uh, so that it is more attractive um, to partake of. So then uh, as well as that, then it uh, provides a least list of resources to help. Um, online information and other agencies that can assist you with guidance of funding. And I know that this has been not an issue, but it's something that we need to collaborate on in Saskatchewan, that, that there are a lot of great organizations that do great work. So we're hoping that this can provide uh, links to all of those and, and help people uh, make sense of that we're at a little bit of a complex uh, landscape. So. So for the area of application for Saskatchewan, we have to determine what is the agricultural area. And we use the crop districts um, and rural municipalities in Saskatchewan. And you can see it overlain on the ecoregions of Saskatchewan map on the right. It is the thick black line. Um, and it encompasses all of the grassland, uh, aspen parkland, boreal transition, and portions of the mid-boreal uplands and lowlands. So then you ask what species uh, we might have in Saskatchewan, and there are some overlaps with Alberta, and we've been able to use um, some of their stewardship opportunities developed. But for Saskatchewan, um, we've included all Sarah listed species, but also Kosovic listed species uh, or ranked species that are endangered, threatened, um, or of special concern. Uh, additionally, I added several CDC, uh, sorry, Tracked species, species that are tracked by the Conservation Data Center in Saskatchewan, that have a large interface with agriculture. In total, uh, we have uh, 74 species currently. So in the future, species can be added or removed. It depends on on how the tool evolves and uh, how species are as they are reevaluated and on an ongoing basis with COSWIC. Um, so this is what the list looks like, and I don't anticipate you're going to read all of this, but um, you can see the birds listed down the center, a considerable number, um, insects on the uh, my screen right, uh, a lot of uh, pollinators, some of which are very general in, uh, generalists in the in landscape, and some of which are very specific and have only very particular hosts. Um, reptiles and amphibians on the left, uh, several snakes, lizard, the more ubiquitous northern leopard frog, more widespread generalist, uh, prairie rattlesnakes, and some species that come in just um, as part of the tall grass prairie fringes, I guess you'd say, uh, into the parkland, um, such as snapping turtle. Um, 
in mammals. Um, American badger is now listed. Uh, the little brown bat and the northern bat, um, swift fox, pronghorn, and a few fish are included. And over on the right, down on the bottom, a list of federally listed uh, plant species, uh, as well as uh, plains rough fescue. So what we did with Saskatchewan um, is on the right hand side is the database knowledge. So these are the pieces of information that the database uses uh, in its decision making matrix um, to assist the farmer and uh, landowner. So there is species risks, uh, species range, data and habitat models information, um, species habitat requirements, um, and then a more complexity uh, around species specific and habitat specific stewardship opportunities. Um, these sometimes apply just to a particular species, but often to a larger group of species. And then all of the species uh, stewardship opportunities are compared against each other. And so that we, we don't end up recommending uh, contrary opportunities that we can, that we end up, you know, <laughs> helping one species and hindering another uh, in the same package. So, so yeah, we've used occurrence data from 2000 to uh, 2020, uh, range data that's available generally uh, through Canadian Wildlife Services, um, habitat suitability index models, and then uh, literature-based habitat data um, with specifics for Saskatchewan ecoregions. So with that, we've developed all of the, the background tools and information data required for Saskatchewan tool to make it operate on our landscape. So then with that, that, those pieces of information, what does the tool do with it and how does this tool work? And that I am going to turn over to Francois who will explain how the tool works and some of the underpinnings and also demo the tool. Thank you, Heather, and um, good night. Good evening, everybody. Um, just, uh... Yeah, so, oh, oh I've got to go to the... Uh... I'm at, already at the end of the presentation here, so let's start at the beginning. All right, so uh, so I'm going to go through a, a little bit of a presentation through the process itself. I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, how the, 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 the tool itself, like how it's organized, and then we're going to go through a little demonstration using the uh, the Alberta site, so see how, how it works. Um, so in... Uh, Heather mentioned that uh, so it, as part of the process we uh, we need to know what uh, what area to focus and Heather mentioned how with the crop district ended up being the the focal area for uh, for this project that's where the agricultural uh, work takes place um, but we also needed to know what kind of management unit we were going to provide recommendation. At, at what level, and uh, since uh, Saskatchewan it is divided into uh, uh, section, quarter section, townships, range, um, we've, and a lot of the uh, management actually takes place at the quarter section level. We figured this, the quarter section would be um, a good uh, uh, management unit to use for this uh, to provide conservation uh, stewardship opportunities. Um, Everything else being equal, um, we wanted to focus on species that are the uh, the most threatened, I guess, the most at, at risk of disappearing. And as Heather mentioned, uh, we looked at the prevent, uh, federal list, but she also looked at the uh, uh, CDC uh, uh, data center uh, list as well. And uh, we ranked them, but uh, in order uh, of, uh, in decreasing order of, uh, of uh, level of endangerment. So uh, the endangered was the highest priority, threatened the second, and special concern had the third priority. We also added to that uh, some um, uh, some priority as well uh, related to the whether the species was uh, restricted in distribution or had some specific uh, habitat requirements, uh, such as the uh, specific habitat features or needed a minimum area patch size or required a certain uh, ecological conditions like pH, temperature and whatnot. So uh, that that raised the the, uh, the the profile, if you want, uh, 
the level of priority for the picture, for the species. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to prioritize our stewardship opportunities in two ways. Uh, we looked at the uh, the expected impact uh, on the on the habitat, so either to maintain or increase habitat and habitat quality, and uh, if the um, if if the expected impact was high, well, it was ranked higher, and uh, uh, if if it was felt to be medium or lower, then uh, it was ranked uh, accordingly. And um, but that's uh, uh, species biased, obviously. Uh, we can have some good stewardship opportunities out there, but if there's no uptake by producers, then uh, it's not going to happen. So we wanted to also rank the uh, or prioritized or stewardship opportunities based on the potential uh, of adoption by agricultural producers. And that's, that was evaluated uh, based on the uh, anticipated or expected cost of implementing those stewardship opportunities. Uh, the, the time that might be required, uh, so the time to implement and maybe the long-term uh, maintenance as well that could be involved, and uh, the economics of so the impact on the bottom line of uh, agricultural producers, um, and uh, whether it's a negative or no impact or maybe uh, uh, continued lost or maybe even positive. Sometimes some of them are uh, have a beneficial impact. So again, uh, there's a rank where it's a high, a fair, or lower potential of uh, adoption. And you'll see uh, how this all comes together in the uh, demonstration I'll do after. Um, also, um, based the, the, the number of species impacted by the uh, stewardship opportunity is also gives it also a higher priority. So you got on the left side here a stewardship opportunities that will help uh, potentially help uh, six species and on the right hand side uh, only one so uh, it's still it's still a good thing to do but uh, the one that that's on the left side all obviously will get a higher uh, priority in our in our uh, ranking system so uh, so then the final stewardship opportunity uh, priority how we prioritize it takes into account what we just saw the number of species the level of endangerment of uh, those species and whether they, they have a restrict, restricted distribution or specific habitat requirements and whether how uh, uh, important the impact uh, will is expected to be anticipated to be on the species or a, the, the potential to be uh, adopted by agricultural producers. But there's also a, a look at the quality of the data that we are using to determine uh, what species occur in a particular uh, core section. And we call that our level of confidence in the data set. So, and I'll explain that a little, bo a little bit more. So Heather mentioned some of the sources of data um, uh, for, for occurrence uh, information about uh, species at risk. And um, so some of these are available as uh, really accurate information. So we can get uh, uh, locational information, lat Latin and long that are given with uh, high accuracy, so they've been measured with uh, using a GPS, something like that. So very precise, you can go back out there with the same uh, coordinates and uh, find exactly where the species occur. So we get either point data, we get sometimes uh, line data for, uh, um, let's say, uh, a creek that uh, where this could be frogs happening in there, uh, occurring in there, and also areas that maybe a patch of uh, habitat for some plants. But we also get some information where the, uh, the, the precision is not, the accuracy is not as, as great, where uh, we're provided with, uh, let's say, the species occurs, but in a certain area, but it's given as a, the middle of a quarter section or the middle of a, of a, of a, of a section. Uh, it's even less uh, accurate, right? Uh, so we don't know within that particular area, within that particular section, where uh, exactly where that species occurs. So it's we have to create those buffers of uncertainty around uh, that observation to capture uh, the potential for that species to be there. So it's not as uh, we're not as confident in those data. So we take that into consideration. We also have, uh, as I had mentioned, some models, some species habitat models or species distribution models. And, and usually if those models are, are well built and uh, 
uh, very robust. They're able to give a good idea of uh, uh, where the, the species can occur. So they, they can be quite reliable and there's a way to test for that. So, so those could be reliable. On the right hand side, we have uh, range maps, which uh, it's outlines the area, general area where the species is expected to uh, or known to occur, uh, but it doesn't tell you exactly where within that area the species occur because there could be there's no information about the habitat so it's just a kind of an outline so it's it's not as uh, reliable information but it still uh, provides the the information uh, about uh, species occurring within that area as a greater potential than uh, being outside that area so it's a, there's still a, a usable useful information in that so um, in evaluating the uh, another thing that the tool does is it evaluates the compatibility of uh, compatibility of those uh, stewardship opportunities, and so like uh, Heather mentioned, that touched on that a little bit too. If uh, if we're providing several um, uh, stewardship opportunities into uh, the same quarter section, we have to make sure that uh, uh, they're compatible with one another. And we have an example here of a, a stewardship opportunity where it's on the left side. The, it's, ask, it's saying maintain or plant shelter belt uh, to achieve tall shrubs. And a second opportunity on the right hand side is uh, do not plant trees or shrubs. So those two are obviously incompatible and should not be provided within the same quarter section. So what it, the tool does, it, it actually uh, separate those uh, stewardship opportunity, opportunities that are compatible put them into packages of compatible stewardship opportunities and and therefore uh, landowners or uh, producers are asked to pick within packages, not among packages. So this is what uh, our, in, uh, our online tool, um, uh, it's a sketch of the, the online tool if you want. We have on the left hand side here a secure user interface that uh, uh, producers uh, will access using a password and a login uh, name and password. And then there's background information, background database that uh, is not seen by uh, the land or the producers, uh, but it's actually where all the calculations are done. So uh, what the producer is asked to do then is to uh, enter the uh, legal land description as an input. And that uh, looks into our occurrence uh, database and it picks out a uh, first list of potential species for that location. So then uh, a second thing that's provided to uh, producer to the user is the uh, a list of habitat types or features that occur in the uh, quarter section that potentially could occur in the quarter section and the producer is asked to uh, check uh, those uh, those that actually occur in the quarter section. So the producer becomes the eyes for the habitat types, habitat features that are there. And that queries are a um, list of um, uh, table of habitat, uh, species habitat requirements. So based on the habitat requirements of species, we come out with another list of species as well. Uh, so we have two lists now that are compared uh, with one another. And where we have a match, the, we end up with a reduced list of potential species for the location and for the habitats that are present at that location. Then those species, uh, the species habitat combination there uh, helps us select the stewardship opportunities for, for those species. And um, these are actually goes through the uh, compati compatibility assessment process. And that, like I mentioned earlier, those uh, uh, those that are compatible are grouped together into packages. And then we bring um, all the information uh, to prioritize the data. We mentioned about the level, the species, their level of endangerment, the, the ranking for the stewardship opportunities, the number of species that are involved and the data quality, that's all combined together and then into uh, put through our prioritizing protocol to uh, provide an output to the uh, to the producer, and that output include includes all the the packages, the different packages of uh, 
uh, mutually compatible uh, stewardship opportunities within the packages, uh, but not among the packages. So producers are asked to pick within packages. There's also additional information on the uh, uh, individual species that are expected to occur in that uh, quarter section and uh, some organizations as well that could help with either implementing those uh, uh, some of these stewardship opportunities or uh, answer some questions or maybe even financial support. So, so uh, I'm going to move on right now to the uh, demonstration. So this is a, um, a public tool of the uh, Habitat and Biodiversity Assessment Tool for Alberta. So therefore, the legal land description that I enter over here is randomized uh, in order to, uh, to uh, not to uh, uh, for security for say, uh, for not reveal information, private information for uh, for those landowners. Um, so I'm just going to enter a random uh, quarter section here. Uh, and Alberta, Meridian is Fort, west of Fort. Okay, and right away the first list of species was um, a queried. We don't see that right now, but it will come up. Um, but now here's the uh, second aspect that the producer is asked to answer is uh, uh, to check all the list of potential habitat features, habitat types that are there. You'll notice that um, uh, we have a question about whether wind turbines are present in there. Uh, it's just because some uh, some species actually could be impacted by the presence of a wind turbine. So we don't want to um, uh, offer some stewardship opportunities that may attract the species in that area. So I'm going to say uh, no for this. And um, so, and also as, uh, as we progress, uh, and you'll see that when I click on some of these, it opens up uh, some other sub uh, categories, if you want, of habitat type features. We have up to three levels of uh, uh, categories of habitat type features. And um, so I'm just going to say no on this one. I'm going to say there is cultivation, but the cultivation is non-irrigated. And I'm going to say there are ground squirrels. There's a few in Saskatchewan, I heard. Um, also, uh, I'm going to say no farmstead. Uh, there's no hay on this quarter section, maybe. We'll say there's milkweed. And we'll say there's native grassland, let's say. And you can see here the subcategory that opens up. And we'll say it's um, lightly to moderate, moderately grazed or more productive areas. And then we'll move on. Tame pasture, we'll say no. Uh, no, let's say, let's put some water in there. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll put a stream along the way. And we'll say there's a, maybe some shrubs uh, along the stream there. Um, shrubs or isolated trees. So we'll put some shrubs there, riparian shrubs. There we go. Okay, and now we've answered all the questions here and we'll move on to the next step. So right away, it's really, really quick. We already have our stewardship opportunities in uh, in Alberta. They're presented, uh, if you present the first three and then we move on to the report after afterwards. So what you see, uh, they're divided on the left-hand side. You can see there's the list of species that are um, would I expect it to be positively impacted by the stewardship opportunity and those are the species that occur at that quarter section or expected potential for that quarter section. The stewardship opportunity in the middle there, um, it's uh, this particular one, it says retain and maintain land as native prairie and there's a score on the right hand side as well that's we talked about that the ranking aspect and the, the higher this score the the greater the impact, the greater the number of species uh, that will um, be affected by the by this particular stewardship opportunity. So, and, and it's provided, it gives you a, a relative um, value as well in terms of priority. Um, there's also the question here. It's asking you a question as whether you already 
doing this particular uh, stewardship opportunity. And uh, let's see, um, um, yeah, I already have some native grassland. I'm doing this, so that's good. We move on to the next one. There's a second one here. It says consider returning planted area to native grassland. So, um, so this is maybe a little bit uh, more difficult to to do and could be costly. So I'm just going to say I'm not doing that. Um, maybe I'm not going to consider doing that either. And uh, move on to the next step. And this one, because I said I'm not doing that, it's giving me a an option for an opportunity that may be easier to implement. So this one is, it says, do not plant trees or shrub on or next to native prairie. I'm gonna say no on this one, but I'm gonna say, yes, I would consider doing that. So those are the three top ones that have been presented. Now, uh, there's a section here where it's actually asking you to enter additional information and that's to for the benefit of your um, your package as well it's so it's saying we we answered this question retain and maintain the land as native prairie uh, we answered already that one we said I am already doing this and we can say it makes sense for my operation so and then we can go to the next one. Uh, consider returning planted area to native grassland. So that was about cropland, returning it to native grassland. We can see, well, it's a uh, costly and um, long term. So that's why I'm not wanting to get into that right away. So, and there's more like this um, uh, that you can answer the whole uh, top uh, package, the first package is, is, is all there. So you can answer all these, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on to the uh, report itself. So there's a PDF uh, report that's uh, uh, provided. And this is all part of the, in Alberta, it's all part of the uh, environmental farm plan, which is done uh, online in Alberta. So that goes into the, um, the, 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 the private, if you want, uh, package for the for the for the producer. So there's the name of the producer. It's so entered over here. Uh, normally, there's also the legal then description that's uh, entered there. There's the introduction that uh, provide you with um, details of the the different sections of the package. So there's a bit of guidance of the what it means. The report means uh, the 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 packages, the various stewardship opportunity packages that are listed there, some of the easy to do stewardship opportunities. And then we have the list of species that potentially occur on this quarter section, along with some extra resources to find out more information about those species, list of key organizations to help out and disclaimer. And then those are the answer, questions you answer there. Stewardship activities you're doing and opportunities uh, yeah, you are open to be uh, doing. So um, this is yeah the first section, uh, understanding the report. Uh, first thing we say, uh, uh, we have not asked you if you have species at risk and we haven't told you that you have species at risk on your land. This is all based on the potential for the species to occur there. There's more information here about the, the numbers, what they what they mean, um, and this is the uh, the actual packages that are coming into um, that are presented. So in this case, there's three packages, and you can see um, so all the stewardship opportunities are are given some points, um, a score if you want. And within a package, all these all these scores are added together to give the total stewardship value of the package. So, so if somebody was to uh, pick a package to and wanted to have the greatest impact on species uh, uh, species at risk, um, then obviously the the package number one in this case would be the one to to choose. Um, yeah, so you can see here uh, the various uh, priorities for all of these. We can move on to show the second package here. Uh, you can see right away it's got a very much lower value. You go from high um, 
uh, score to moving quickly to low. So usually below 10, uh, we're saying, you know, if you want to implement these, talk to someone because uh, we're really, there's a lot of uncertainty that comes into the, into the, into play for us assigning a low value like that. So, so really the very first package is probably your best bet in, in this case. Um, again, this one has a high stewardship opportunity, uh, score for the first uh, stewardship opportunity, but it moves really quickly to some lower scores over here. Um, so these are the easy to do stewardship opportunities. Uh, you know, that was that other ranking of stewardship opportunities that we talked about. Uh, those are ranked in order of uh, IS, uh, the easiest one to a little harder, but uh, a lot of it is uh, Base, uh, avoid doing things, do not uh, do things, or keep your native prairie, avoid building trails. Uh, so it's it's fairly easy to to implement, and really they do have an impact on species at risk. So they all good to good to know and good to implement. Um, <clears throat> and the last, the next section is about the. So this is your list of species that potentially occur in. Um, in, in your quarter section, selected quarter sections, uh, we we have uh, there in alpha, alphabetical order. I mean, you have the uh, the level level of endangerment. That's uh, the status that's presented there. And each of these um, uh, hyperlinks uh, provide you uh, more information about that species somewhere that's somewhere else on the on the on the internet. Um, yeah, and those are the key organization that uh, you could contact to get a little more uh, information or visit their website and uh, they might be able to help you with some implementation as well or could be some uh, funding opportunities. So there's the uh, final thing is the, well, no, it's not quite final yet, I think, the disclaimer. Uh, where we see some of the recommendation may involve important changes so uh, to the management of the selected land parcel. So uh, before you make important changes, you contact someone, some organization or expert to, uh, to make sure that this is the right thing for you. Um, so, and this is the section where we, this is the information that, that you provided about the um, stewardship opportunities you know, where you answer some questions those that you are doing already. So we want to acknowledge that, that you are doing some things that are uh, important for uh, species at risk. And those are the, the ones that you are open, you would consider doing uh, given uh, an opportunity. So, so this is uh, it for me. I'm going to return that to uh, Heather for the closing. Thank you, Francois. Um, if I could get my screen share, Carolyn, please show my screen. And the current slide. There we go. So, uh, thank you, Francois. That was great. Um, as you can see, it's not a simple process to <laughs> build this tool, and um, but yet the output, um, I think, can be fairly helpful and um, accessible. Uh, so the question then is where are we at in Saskatchewan? Um, currently we are ready to start testing the tool. It's just about to um, be, be fully populated with the data um, and will be functional although not to the public um, by the end of this month and the tool then will start testing the tool and modifying uh, accordingly so that we've you know make sure that it's working the way we, we expect it to. Um, and then the intent is to eventually customize the interface and the output reports through beta testing um, and consultation with uh, cons uh, conservation groups, but also with uh, landowners directly. And we would anticipate that it would be coming online um, within this coming year. And so be aware that the tool is a living document. Um, some of the things that we're uh, starting in Saskatchewan are being uh, added to the Alberta tool and you know it's it's a big long iterative process always trying to make it better um, so it will be updated as data becomes available and um, expected changes would be improved stewardship opportunities um, if we get feedback on on the, what's being offered um, and additional occurrence data may come in um, and more habitat suitability models, which are very effective for uh, accurate estimates of where our species might occur. 
Um, and access to the online tool. Um, at this point, the tool, no, always, this tool is built as a standalone online tool. Um, the plan is to host the tool on the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association website uh, once the full trials and adjustments are complete. Um, and it may be uh, integrated with the new online environmental farm plan uh, once it's developed, but it will remain as a standalone tool. Um, and just to preempt one of the favorite questions about this tool is who sees the data for my land? And I think Francois already addressed this um, in terms of the security levels, um, but basically only the landowner. Um, so there's secured password access to the tool, which you saw uh, Francois using. Um, the species data in the tool is not identified as being occurrence model or range source data, so you don't actually know what informed the, the tool as to why that species might be listed on your list. Um, no data input by the landowners is stored. And the output reports, as uh, Francois showed you, are stored only for the landowner's use and access. So the potential exists for the landowner to choose to share that information with an agency that may be helping them with their stewardship work. Um, so eventually, essentially, it kind of uh, functions like a undepletable free vending machine for habitat assessment and stewardship information. And we're hoping to make it accessible to everyone. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest. Um, I look forward to working with producers to make this tool better and to work for them. Uh, and to thank Francois who collaborated uh, in the original build of the Alberta online tool and is assisting greatly with the adaptations for Saskatchewan. It would not be happening without Francois. And also to thank uh, Cedric McLeod who's the executive director of uh, CFGA. He kind of keeps the wheels on the bus and also going around. And um, thanks to Environment and Climate Change Canada for funding, and uh, obviously CFGA uh, for operating this project. And lastly, and not least, I'd like to thank uh, Carolyn and PCAP uh, for inviting us to present here, and I appreciate your time and uh, attention. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much, Francois and Heather. That was great. Um, there are a few questions, but we don't um, have a whole lot of time. Um, so if you could keep your um, answers brief, we'll maybe put two. Um, is there okay. somewhere we can sign up to volunteer as landowners to help test it? Sorry, I'm just trying to... <laughs> GoTo wants me to answer some questions. Um, uh, the, we're going to start off with uh, producers that have worked with association or with uh, groups right now. Um, Maybe the best way to connect uh, Nature Saskatchewan uh, has talked about uh, incorporating, offering some of their landowners. So that might be a way if you connect with Nature Saskatchewan or through PCAP, um, just to connect uh, with interest for that. Um, and that would get through to me. Sure, that sounds good. And another question from Tom. Uh, do they have to enter each quarter section Separately, like if he has 20 section, 27 quarters, does yeah. he only view the management quarter by quarter? The, so what we're, that we are working on a system to uh, try to lump a uh, group like larger pastures, etc. But at this point, what we're asking is that a producer can um, input a representative quarter. So yes, nobody wants to enter 10 sections of land. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'll be putting in and saying, okay, well, this one represents this, you know, section here that I uh, treat in a certain way. And, and that's how we're, we're proposing that we move forward with this as a start. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's all the time we have for Faswa and Heather. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, you, we are going to move on to our presentation. Let's see. Mm -hmm. 
I, uh, I'm currently at home because we're quarantining, so my internet isn't as good as it uh, normally is when I'm at the office. Um, so next up, we have Sue Mahalski, who is a beef and lamb producer. Her work experience centers on livestock and range management, conservation planning, and agri-environmental uh, policy. Um, so Sue, if you want to unmute yourself and just say something to make sure that your audio works when your uh, section comes up. Okay, how's that? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm, as I said before, Carolyn Gannett. And I've been with the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan since 2017. And I have over 10 years of experience with habitat stewardship, research, and uh, data collection. So our presentation is on this multi-species habitat attribute guide that we are uh, developing. Uh, I'll just start with a bit of background information and then Sue will go through some examples for you. Uh, so the first habitat attribute guide was completed in 2014 for the Greater Sage Grouse by the uh, Rancher Stewardship Alliance, Inc. Um, and to develop this sage grouse guide, uh, they reviewed existing sage grouse recovery programs and recovery strategies and action plans applicable, applicable to the silver sagebrush habitat. They went through scientific literature and enlisted uh, species advisors. And the review focused on information related to, um, I guess, providing optimal silver sagebrush habitat for uh, greater sage grouse. And they also included the evaluation of results-based practices. So then PCAP started developing uh, species guides in 20, 2016, kind of based on their model. And since then, we've completed nine guides on uh, the burrowing owl, the piping plover, the loggerhead shrike, the northern leopard frog, the bared sparrow, the chestnut colored longspur, the swift fox, the monarch, and the little brown myotis or little brown bat. And so uh, these guides were developed along the same lines. We used recovery strategies or management plans, scientific literature, and consulted species experts to determine optimal habitat attributes. Um, the PCAP single species guides also include non-habitat beneficial management practices for the species. Um, we also received data from Dr. Steve Davis from the Canadian Wildlife Service for uh, the Sprague's pipit and the thick-billed uh, longspur, which used to be known as the Macowan's longspur. Um, so between these 11 species and the sage grouse, we'll have uh, 12 species in our guide. So there are different opinions on whether conservation should focus on a single species, multiple species, the community, a landscape, or, or an ecosystem. And each focus has their own like, pros and cons, which I won't go into today. Um, but overlapping habitat attributes exist between multiple species at both the landscape scale and the finer site scale, which may present challenges to management if habitat requirements are mutually exclusive on a parcel of land. So we thought the next logical step was to combine our single species guides to see where those habitat attributes overlap and contrast. So there's um, already a lot of, or there's other programs that focus on multi-species management. It's not a new approach. Um, like Grasslands National Park has a multi-species management plan. 
there's like multi-species action plan for the south of the divide area. So it's not new. Um, here's kind of an example. So these are Heather's illustrations that she did for our single species guides. Um, so managing habitat for a sprague's pipit, which is here at the top, um, requires like continuous grass vegetation that's not too tall, see it avoids tall, dense vegetation, and uh, not too short. So it prefers this like medium height, medium density vegetation, um, which you get by light to moderate grazing and other disturbances like periodic uh, prescribed fires. And so that might reduce habitat avail availability for species that have uh, other requirements, like the loggerhead trach, for uh, tall shrubs and vegetation of like variable height. Um, yeah, so that disturbance, that management of grasslands, um, the fire and the grazing, often removes the woody vegetation from, uh, or prevents woody encroachment and that kind of thing. Um, so it's important to consider multiple species. Um, the other uh, concepts I want to define are BMPs and habitat attributes. So beneficial management practices is any management practice that reduces or eliminates an environmental risk. Um, so an example of that would be like to avoid using insecticides on native grasslands or avoid planting uh, woody vegetation in native rangeland and that kind of thing. Whereas uh, ha the habitat attribute is defined as any living or non-living feature of an environment that provides resources necessary for a species in a particular setting. So an example of that would be like vegetation height or density or the amount of woody vegetation and things like that. So we've had many conversations with Heather over the past year discussing how our projects, like this our guide versus the CFGA tool, how they're different. Um, but they do kind of dovetail into each other, providing more information to landowners. Um, <clears throat> so we'll go through kind of how landowners can use the guide. I'll go quickly go through step one, and then Sue will go through um, the guide itself. So landowners can contact Happy Sask uh, to request um, to sign an agreement to access the protected information uh, in their project screening tool, or they can ask uh, PCAP or myself um, and send me their quarter sections and I can do it for them. Um, and so how Happy Sask works is uh, once you get into there, you have to turn on all the useful layers, like the predictive species models, the rare species occurrences, rangeland ecosites, critical habitat, and all of those things. And then you go into the project screening tool, which is under Habi Sass, or sorry, Habi Tools, and define like the project area or the ranch or the quarter section. Like you can, if you know where the ranch and all the quarter sections are, you can kind of draw it in or you can upload like a shape file of the area, which is probably the easiest. Um, anyways, and then from there you create a report with all the species that occur there. So on this example, uh, we have the monarch, the barred sparrow, the brown owl, the chestnut colored longspur, the loggerhead trike, uh, the thick billed longspur, northern leopard frog, piping clover, and sprague spit. So nine out of the 12 species included in our guide. And then you have to go back to Handy Sask and uh, kind of query for rangeland ecosites to see which ecosite would occur on the ranch. And then you get a report with all the ecosites 
like you see. So on this particular ranch, there's uh, saline sub-irrigated, solonetic loam, solonetic overflow, and overflow. Those are all the types of ecocytes that you would find there. Um, yeah, so then we'll go on to um, Sue. You can take it from here and describe what an ecocyte is. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm going to have to tell you when to advance the slides, I guess, since it's still yes. on your computer. Okay, yeah. so we're going to work through an example, and, and Carolyn kind of uh, designed step one so that there was some overflow ecocytes on, on her Happy Sask selection. Um, so it's the it's the overflow ecocyte that we're going to go through work through as an example, um, and and the guide's going to be uh, divided by ecocyte. So there will be a section on uh, on each ecocyte grouping, um, and then all of the species at risk habitat information for that ecocyte. So. On this little table I have here, um, I just want to show you what level we're working at. So the overflow ecocyte is actually divided. So overflow ecocyte, for those who need a definition, it's it's uh, land that uh, experiences an overland flow of water um, normally uh, at least once a year. Um, so it's subdivided into three different uh, categories, so uh, kind of an upland overflow, uh, overflow on solanetic soils, and overflow on saline soils. Um, we don't have the data to work at the subdivided level, so we're going to work at the at the main ecocyte level. So over overflow, which includes all those three subcategories, is going to be the the ecocyte level that we uh, are demonstrating here today. So next slide. Carolyn, oh, thank you. Um, so this is just the, uh, a legend for the map that I'm going to show next. Um, so the range ecocytes for southern Saskatchewan. And I just want to point out in the third column there, the first three uh, colors, like that lime green thing, and then lime green with black dots, and then lime green with brown dots. Those are the, the three subcategories of overflow. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, we can talk a little bit about where those are in Saskatchewan. Now, it's hard to see. In fact, it's really hard to see now. <laughs> it was hard to see on my computer at this scale, but I'll just describe because you can't, I can't, so I'm assuming you guys can't see that lime green hardly anywhere. But uh, it occurs mainly in southwest Saskatchewan. So it's along the Frenchman River. It's in the east block of Grasslands National Park. There's some in the three uh, federal pastures down in the southwest. There is some along the river up in the sand hills, and there's some just south of Saskatoon. There are uh, uh, overflow ecocytes in the moist mixed grass as well, but they're, they don't show up at this scale. Um, and it's quite rare on the east side of the, of the province. So next slide. So in the guide, we will describe the ecocyte um, and, and, and the typical plant communities in an ecocyte are one of the things that we're going to include. So um, in the overflow ecocyte, sort of typical plant communities uh, would include the silver sagebrush wheatgrass, which is shown in the photo there in the, in the corner. Um, uh, and a typical grass community uh, without very many shrubs would be the western wheatgrass, western porcupine grass, northern wheatgrass community, and we call that a reference community because it's, uh, um, I wouldn't say in the absence of disturbance, uh, but it's in the absence of disturbance that would have a, a big effect on that plant community. So um, if there is a disturbance like heavy grazing or intense fire or even recreational use uh, that that uh, modifies that community, it moves into that next uh, community that I have listed there. So pasture sage, western wheatgrass. So um, if you're familiar at all with the, the types of plant communities we have in the province, that gives you a good overview of what the overflow ecocyte supports. 
So next, uh, next slide. So here's a list of the species at risk found on the overflow ecosite. And we, we had uh, the Saskatchewan CDC um, basically run a, a test on their database to give us this information. So it's very similar actually to the list that Carolyn had uh, from her Habisask um, example there. So I'm not gonna go through it species by species. Um, next slide. So here's a sample, and the next few slides are, are different samples of uh, multi-species habitat information that we're producing uh, that are going to be included in the guide. In the top left-hand corner there, you can see the legend. And so we've basically divided the, the uh, attributes into preferred, which is green, uh, less preferred, but still used, which is yellow, and not preferred, so they're rarely found there, which is uh, red. So um, this is this example is bare ground, and in this situation, we've given you two graphs, one for the moist mixed grass uh, ecoregion and one for the mixed grassland ecoregion. And the reason we did that was to illustrate that some of these species respond differently to habitat attributes depending on what ecoregion they're in. So if you look at Baird Sparrow, in the moist mixed grass, they're less tolerant of like zero to five percent bare ground than they are in the mixed grass. In the mixed grassland, it's perfect. They are they can go right down to zero bare ground without any problem. Um, the other thing that uh, that the, the two graphs show is is that extra species that occurs in the mixed grass. So the, the I'm going to call it McCown's longspur because I'm not in a couple of years maybe I can call it thick build, but but right now it's McCown's. So so we add uh, McCown's longspur because it occurs in the mixed grass and it, it's not common in the moist moist mixed grass. So um, next slide. Good. So um, this is litter, um, so in pounds per acre. And uh, there's a, an additional species on the bottom of here. We've got the four birds that we had uh, in the last slide as well. Um, but we've got northern leopard frog also responds to litter. So it has some intolerances of too much or too little litter. And you'll notice that the line for the northern leopard frog has, instead of these uh, cutoffs that we have for the birds, um, it has, it's sort of a gradient. And that's just basically because we don't have as good a data for the northern leopard frog as we do for the birds. So next slide. So I should note, while well, Carolyn's switching that, that the bird data, and, and she, um, alluded to this already, um, was uh, analyzed for us by Dr. Steve Davis um, from a like a, a mega data set from, from numerous studies. So thousands of bird uh, sampling has, has gone into this and he, um, he modeled um, these tolerances and preferences um, from, from that large database for us so that we have really good data for the grassland bird species. So this is vegetation height. And what I wanted to point out here is the conflict between species for vegetation height. So you can see that Baird Sparrow and Sprigg's Pipit like that sort of middle of the range height in the kind of 10 to 20 centimeter range, whereas chestnut colored longspur and, and McCowan's um, are in the shorter end with McCowan's of course being shortest. Um, so, so you couldn't manage the same parcel for both species. Um, and I, I, uh, there's a, a lot to say about this. It's fairly complex, but, uh, um, so managing for all four of those species basically means that you would have to manage for different uh, habitat attributes on different parts of your land base. And, and I'll, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about 
kind of what scale we're talking about for, for that. So next slide. So this is visual obstruction, and that's basically uh, how well the animals can see and how well predators can see them. So you can see that Baird's and Sprague's Pippet uh, like to have a little bit of cover, um, probably so they can't be seen as easily by predators, whereas the long spurs like to, like to have good sight lines. And uh, I know from doing the individual guides for the for the long spurs that that is uh, what they need for hunting for prey. So um, I should point out here that the habitat attributes that we're using are those that have been identified by the species experts as being important for the species. So next slide. So this is shrub cover, uh, shrubs less than one meter high. Uh, so we've got a, a couple of extra species here, which is great. Um, although uh, it does kind of portray that most endemic grassland species are intolerant of, of woody vegetation because they're all on the on the left hand side there. The green is all on the left hand side, um, but sage grouse will end up on this graph in for for the overland uh ecosite in the in the final document we just haven't got that far and they do have a preference for low sage brush so there will be uh something of a conflict uh showing up in this in this graph later so um i i should note here that the species attributes that we're using are primarily at the site level. And so um, I can give you like a little bit of a, an idea of how that works. So for example, some of the grassland birds, their home ranges are like uh, less than 10 acres, um, but they select uh, for a home range based on kind of suitable habitat within at least a quarter section in size. So if you're trying to manage for, for more than one species, um, you need to do it on a scale bigger than a quarter section because you might be managing uh, one quarter section for uh, Baird's Sparrow and Sprague's Pipit and another one for another suite of species. So just to give you kind of a a scale that that this can be applied from. So next um, slide. So that's all the the graphs that we have to show you. There there will be others coming for the guide. Um, but what what another section in the guide we have um, to deal with individual um, habitat attributes. And the reason that we're putting a section in on individual habitat attributes is because there are attributes for species that aren't relevant to other species. And so the example I have here is the monarch butterfly. Um, the monarch really doesn't respond to any of the multi-species attributes that we that we have in the multi-species guide. So we're going to do just a short section that basically summarizes that we have in in our uh, guides to individual species. Um, so a little map from the CDC on where the monarchs likely to occur. Heather's overview graph that shows what they like and what they don't like from a higher level. And then the next slide, Carolyn. Um, so this table from our habitat species guide for for the monarch will go in and you can see the hab the monarch has really specific habitat requirements. So um, when we did this guide, uh, the experts uh, advised us to divide it up into habitat attributes for natural habitat, for agriculture habitat, and for restored habitat. Um, and the restored habitat is in there because there are there are a lot of acres of restored habitat that have been restored specifically for monarch butterfly. So for breeding habitat for the monarchs, they respond to things like uh, the patch size and configuration for of milkweed, um, how far the milkweed patches are away from each other, what the density of milkweed is within a in a patch, um, how many species of milkweed there are. 
and then um, and then there's a whole you can go to the next slide there's a whole uh, similar sort of bunch of features for their nectaring plants uh, so nectaring habitat same sort of thing, diversity, frequency, um, and then migrating and staging habitat, which we have very little of in Saskatchewan and we don't know much about it. Uh, but basically they need uh, nectaring for diversity and, and roosting locations. So none of, none of those uh, attributes are really relevant to any other species. So that's my best example of why we need to put the individual ones in there too. So next slide. So um, this is, uh, <laughs> which long spur am I looking at? Chestnut collard, thank you. Um, so this is, is the single species information for the chestnut collard long spur, and it is pretty much the opposite of the monarch. Most of the species, or most of the habitat attributes that are applicable to the chestnut collard long spur are multi-species attributes. Um, so the only thing that I can point out on the on the diagram there that that isn't included in as a multi-species attribute is that avoidance of structures. And I noticed that Heather mentioned um, wind turbines in her presentation, and so this would be an example of of that they avoid wind turbines. So that would be about the only species or habitat attribute that's different from the from a bunch of other species. So um, next slide. So I'm not going to go through any of this in detail. We have the for the individual species, we've divided up the habitat attributes by landscape scale, uh, which is uh, overview GIS level type things, um, topography, soil type, uh, land cover, that kind of thing, and then site scale habitat, which is the next slide, Carolyn. Um, and the, the site scale habitat, as I said earlier, is the, is, is the focus of the multi-species uh, attributes that we're, we'll cover in the guide. So I just, I'm just going to close my part of the presentation by saying that uh, we, we've been learning over the years that managing for habitat quality is, is one of the best ways to recover species. Um, many other, other types of activities, land securement, many of the BMPs are about slowing the decline. And of course we need to do both. Um, and, but for sure, if we, if we want to recover species, we're going to have to work at uh, restoring habitat and improving the quality of it. So that's our, our focus here. So that's, it. that's the end of my section. Um, Carolyn, are you going to close it off? Yes. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, so in addition to Sue's um, conclusion and take home messages, I also want to mention that um heterogeneity is like very important while managing for multiple species we need lots of like patchy habitat to accommodate all the species that need habitat um, and the idea for our guide is that um, we can provide landowners with the information about what species need and then the landowners can take that into account if they want to attract those species um, so that's all I have uh, for our presentation. Uh, just a thank you to uh, Steve Davis for analyzing and that data. Um, as Sue said, his data set has 5,000 uh, data points throughout Southern Saskatchewan. So it's um, quite big and useful. <laughs> um, also thank you to Heather and Eric who are contractors on the uh, on the project, Heather did all the graphs, and Eric did some work early on. Um, so we don't really have time for questions since it's already past um, 8:30. Um, so. We, I think for the questions that are there, we'll like answer them uh, like directly or 
we'll answer all of them and then send them all to uh, the participants, I think. I think that might be the easiest and that way you guys can be kind of let off the hook for the evening since it's already late. Um, so on behalf of Nature Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, I would sincerely uh, like to thank Ashley, Heather, Francois, and Sue for their great presentations today and to our listeners for tuning in. Thank you all so much for attending this workshop. Um, you will receive an email or I guess um, some kind of link for the uh, survey. Uh, it's just a quick questionnaire, please fill it out. It'll take maybe two minutes. We'll give us more information about um, who you are and how we can improve these workshops and things like that. Uh, for upcoming events, um, like the like PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series or the last presentation of our Prairies Got the Good Goods Week, uh, which is tomorrow, you can check out PCAP's website, which is www.pcap-sk.org. Um, and remember to check out the Nature Saskatchewan and PCAP YouTube channels in the near future for the recording of this video. Um, so thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thanks so much everybody.